We used to live, my wife and I, in a glassy cabin on a mountain peak surrounded by a national forest. Our job was to watch. Watch what? Well, watch just about everything. To us, it seemed like the center of the world. When clouds gathered, we watched for lightning where it struck. After the lightning, we'd watch for smoke in the trees, and when and if it appeared a few hours later or a couple of days later, we'd locate the smoke with our precision firefinder and radio the news to forest headquarters. The report generally went like this. Phoenix, this is Aztec Peak, 1073. 1073 is a forest radio code for fire. Go ahead, Aztec. We've got a little smoke for you at 842 degrees and 30 minutes southwest side of Two Bar Ridge. It's a single snag, blue-gray smoke, small volume, intermittent puffs, a light wind from the west, heavy fuel but not spreading. 10-4, Aztec, let us know if it grows. While fire crews were dispatched to find and put out the fire, my wife and I returned to our job of watching. We watched the clouds again, and the weather, and approaching and departing storms. We watched the sun go down behind four peaks in the Superstition Mountains, that sundown legend retold and recurring every evening, day after day after day. We saw the planet Venus, bright as radium, floating close to the shoulder of the new moon. We watched the stars and meteor showers, and the snaky ripple of cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning coursing across the sky at night. We watched the birds. One day, a little nuthatch flew into our cabin through an open window, banged its silly head against the closed window opposite, and dropped to the floor. I picked up the tiny bird, holding it in my palm. I could feel the beating of its furious heart. I set it down on the catwalk outside in the sunlight. After a while, the nuthatch came to, shook its head, lofted its wings, and fluttered off. What can you think of a bird that crashes into glass and creeps headfirst down the trunk of a pine? The forest spread below us in summer in a dozen different hues of green, from olive drab to aquamarine. There were yellow pine and pinion pine, blue spruce and Engelmann spruce, white fir and Douglas fir, quaking aspen, New Mexico locust, alligator juniper, and four kinds of oak. Along the rim rock of the escarpment, where warm air rose from the canyons beneath, grew manzanita, agave, soto, and several species of cactus, prickly pear, pincushion, fishhook. Far down in the canyons, where water flowed, though not always on the surface, we could see sycamore, alder, box elder, cottonwood, walnut, hackberry, wild cherry, and wild grape, and a hundred other kinds of tree, shrub, and vine that I would probably never learn to identify by name. The naming of things is a useful mnemonic device, enabling us to distinguish and utilize and remember what otherwise might remain an undifferentiated sensory blur. But I don't think names tell us much of character, essence, or meaning. Einstein thought that the most mysterious aspect of the universe, if it is indeed a universe, not a pluriverse, is what he called its rationality. Being primarily a mathematician and only secondarily a violinist, Einstein saw the world as rational because so many of its properties and so much of its behavior can be described through mathematical formulas. The atomic bomb and Hiroshima made a convincing argument for his point of view, as does the ignition of juniper twigs by the agency of friction into heat, smoke, and flame. Mass is transformed into energy, emitting light, employing fire lookouts. Even so, I find something narrow and too specialized in Einstein's summary of the situation. The specialist's viewpoint may go deep, but it cannot go all the way through. How could it if the world, though finite, is unbounded? Nor does its practical utility nuclear bombs, make up for its lack of breadth. 
All special theories suffer from this defect. The lizard sunning itself on a stone would no doubt tell us that time, space, sun, and earth exist to serve the lizard's interests. The lizard, too, must see the world as reducible to a rational formula. Relative to the context, the lizard's metaphysical system seems as complete as Einstein's. But to me, the most mysterious thing about the universe is not its rationality, but the fact that it exists, and the same mystery attaches to everything within it. The world is permeated through and through by mystery, by the incomprehensible, by creatures like you and me and Einstein and the lizards. Modern science and technology have given us the engineering techniques to measure, analyze, and take apart the immediate neighborhood, including the neighbors. But this knowledge adds not much to our understanding of things. Knowledge is power, said Francis Bacon, great-great-grandfather of the nuclear age. Power, exactly. That's been the point of the game all along. But power does not lead to wisdom, even less to understanding. Sympathy, love, physical contact, touching are better means to so fine an end. Vague talk, I agree. This blather about mystery is probably no more than a confession of intellectual laziness. Let's have no more metaphysical apologetics. Throw metaphysic to the dogs, I say, and watch the birds. I'd rather contemplate the noble turkey vulture soaring on the air, contemplating me, than speculate further on Einstein's theories, astrophysics, or the significance of the latest computer printouts from Kitt Peak Observatory and NASA. The computer tapers have a word for it. Gigo. Garbage in, garbage out. Output equals input. Numbers in, numbers out, nothing more. Nino, a double negation. Anything reduced to numbers in algebra is not very interesting. Useful, of course, for the processing of data, physical relations, human beings, but not interesting. The vultures are interesting. In the morning... They would rise, one by one, from their communal roost a quarter mile below our lookout, and disperse themselves to the four quarters of the firmament. Each patrols its chosen or allocated territory. Rising so high and sailing so far, it soon becomes invisible to human eyes, even when our human eyes are aided by seven by fifty binoculars. But although we cannot always see them, the buzzards keep an eye on one another, as well as on the panorama of life and death below. And when one bird descends for an actual or potential lunch, its mates notice and come from miles away to join the feast. This is the principle of evolutionary success, mutual aid. At evening, near sundown, the vultures would return. Friendly, tolerant, gregarious birds, they like to roost each night on the same dead pine below. One by one, they spiraled downward, weaving transparent figures in the air, while others maintained a holding pattern, sinking slowly, gradually, as if reluctant to leave the heights, toward the lime-spattered branches of the snag. They might even have had nests down in there somewhere although I could never see one, with little buzzard chicks waiting for supper. Try to imagine a baby vulture. Gathered on their favorite dead tree, heads nodding together, the vultures resembled from our vantage point a convocation of bald, politic funeral directors discussing business prospects. Always good. Dependable. The mature birds have red, wrinkled, featherless heads, the heads of the young are a bluish color and also naked. The heads are bald because it's neater, safer, more sanitary, given the line of work. If you made your living by thrusting your beak and eyes and neck deep into the rotting entrails, say, of a dead cow, you too would prefer to be bald as a buzzard. 
feathers on the head would impede a hasty withdrawal when necessary, and might provide lodging for maggots, beetles, worms, and bacteria, best for the trade to keep sleek and tidy. I respect vultures myself, even like them, I guess, in a way, and fully expect some day to join them, internally at least. One should plan one's reincarnation with care. I like especially the idea of floating among the clouds all day, seldom stirring a feather, meditating on whatever it is that vultures meditate about. It looks like a good life from down here. We had some golden eagles in the area, too, but seldom got a look at them. Uncommon and elitist birds, aloof as warlords, they generally hang out as far as possible from human habitat. Who can blame them? Sheepmen and others shoot them on sight, on general principles. Our hero, Ernest Hemingway, could not resist the temptation to bag an eagle now and then, though he hated himself afterward. Not an easy job to be, or to have been, Ernest Hemingway. Eleanor Wiley advised emulation. Avoid the reeking herd, shun the polluted flock, live like that stoic bird, the eagle of the rock. But she spent most of her time in New York City. Can't blame her either, every bird in its proper place. The red-tailed hawk is a handsome character. I enjoyed watching the local hunter come planing through the pass between our mountaintop and the adjoining peak, there to catch the wind and hover in place for a while, head twitching back and forth as it scans the forest below. When he or she spots something live and edible, down she goes at an angle of forty-five degrees, feet first, talons extended, wings uplifted, feathers all a-flutter, looking like a Victorian lady in skirts and ruffled pantaloons jumping off a bridge. The hawk disappears into the woods. I watch, binoculars ready. She rises seconds later from the trees with something wriggling, alive, in her right foot. A field mouse. The hawk sails high in the air. The mouse is fighting, bites the hawk on the shank. I can see these details without difficulty. And the startled red tail drops her prey. The mouse falls down and away, also at an angle of forty-five degrees, carried eastward by the wind. The hawk stoops, swoops, and recaptures the mouse a hundred feet above the treetops, carries it to the broken-off top of a pine, perches there, still holding the struggling mouse in her claws, and makes one quick stab of beak to the mouse's head. I see a spurt of red. The mouse is still. The hawk gulps down her lunch raw and whole in one piece as an owl does. Later, after craw and gizzard have done their work, the hawk will regurgitate a tiny ball of fur and toenails. We watch the storms of late afternoon, sun descending in a welter of brawling purple clouds. Spokes of gold wheel across the sky. Jags and jets of lightning flicker from cloud to cloud and from cloud to earth. Mighty kettle drums thunder in the distance. My wind gauge reads thirty-five knots. The trees sway and the wind booms through the forest. Watching the vultures gather below, I noticed a disturbance. A small gray-backed falcon was diving among the vultures, harrying the laggards. It was a peregrine falcon, rare but not extinct. Watching through the glasses, I saw one vulture actually flapping its wings to escape the falcon. Unusual exertion for a vulture. The falcon strikes, their bodies collide in what appears to me as a glancing blow. A few vulture feathers float off in the wind, the vulture flaps into the shelter of the trees, swearing quietly, apparently unharmed. Tiring of this sport, the falcon skims upward in a sweeping arc, shooting through the circling vultures, winging higher and higher into the sky, and stops at the apex of its parabola to hover there, 
still as a star, facing the wind, the lightning, the advancing storm. The falcon hangs in space for second after second, motionless, as if suspended on a thread, its wings, body, and spirit in perfect equilibrium with the streaming torrents of the air. Give your heart to the hawks, urged Robinson Jeffers. Okay, I thought, I'll do that for this one splendid moment, until the Vulcan shears off on the wind and vanishes in storm and light. Appealing as I find the idea of reincarnation, I must confess that it has a flaw. To wit, there is not a shred of evidence suggesting it might be true. The idea has nothing going for it but desire, the restless aspiration of the human mind. But when was aspiration ever intimidated by fact? Given a choice, I plan to be a long-winged, fan-tailed bird next time around. Which one? Vulture? Eagle? Hawk? Falcon? Crane? Heron? Wood Ibis? Well, I believe I was a Wood Ibis once, back in the good old days of the Pleistocene Epoch. And from what I already know of passion, violence, the intensity of the blood, I think I'll pass on Eagle, Hawk, or Falcon this time. For a lifetime or two, or maybe three, I think I'll settle for the sedate career, serene and soaring, of the humble turkey buzzard. And if any falcon comes around making trouble, I'll spit in his eye, or hers, and contemplate this world we love from a silent and considerable height. <laughs>